first, thank you all for staying to the last session today. And uh, so my name is Lang Hui Wam, I'm a data scientist from Max Point. And today I'm going to talk about how to balance scale and uh, interpretability in analytical uh, applications with scikit-learn and interpreting methods. So first I want to introduce the background for this project. So first, uh, what we are doing in Max Point. So you may learn a lot from my colleague's talk today or yesterday. So um, Max Point is a digital advertising technology and a business intelligence company that want to drive uh, local customers to uh, offline actions like a visit or a purchase in store with, with measurable results. And the technologies we use, including target the right audience in physical or digital uh, spaces, and we optimize the ad campaigns um, to improve the advertising efficiency. And also, after the campaign ends, and also when the campaign is running, we provide measurements and uh, provide insights to see where the ad campaigns can improve the sales for the products in stores. And also, at the same time, we want to find if there's anything, any other interesting sales drivers for those products. And we work with uh, major brands, retailers, and agencies over uh, across the United States. And today, I want to focus on measurement and insights. So this is what my project is doing. The one very interesting and the challenging question that our customers want us to answer is which factors drive sales for certain products in their stores. And we have many, many data sources, very different data sources to use to answer this question. Like the weather data, uh, for example, the umbrellas may have better sales when it's raining. So the weather data may help to interpret the sales. We have demographic data that includes gender, age, and the type of jobs in the neighborhood. So for example, some, uh, for some luxury snake, um, the average income in that neighborhood may ha have some high correlation with the sales for that product. And also we have data for online topic consumption. So we know which type of web pages that neighborhood is most interested in. So that type of data may be highly correlated with some products. And also we have some other types of data uh, where I didn't put here because of the limitation of space here. So with so many available data and with the goal to interpret the sales for the products, um, the question is like how we can solve this problem. And when we want to tackle this challenge, we found many problems. And uh, uh, so in our company, we have very lots of smart uh, analysts and the data scientists work together. And all of them have very different backgrounds. They have, have um, different understanding of data set and the different mo modern approaches. But it's very really hard to compare the prediction powers among different models and among different data set because Usually they use like Python notebook to do modeling, and some of them even use R. So it's very really hard to transfer uh, those modeling process to the other, to, to generalize the modeling approach to other products to compare the prediction powers among them. And also there's some correlation between models. For example, some product may uh, have some correlation with both valid data and the seasonality data. So, and uh, also it's possible that both of them can uh, provide very well prediction. Then how can we choose one but not choose the other one and use that to, um, to, to, um, to, to show to our customer? And the other problem is that um, we want to generalize these modeling approaches and the uh, different data set to different uh, products. And uh, we don't just want them to be one-time effort. So, um, so before that, um, the analyst doing the modeling process using notebooks. So they, after the notebook is done, they save it somewhere. So if we, 
if you are interested in their model, in the new data set, you need to like uh, email them or chat them online to find their notebook and start to learn from those notebooks. So it's not very convenient to generalize those approaches to a new, uh, for new products. And also it's not easy to improve those uh, modeling approaches. And also we want to share the knowledge among different peoples. So uh, as a data scientist, the most fun part for me is to do modeling. It's not data processing, data importing. Maybe some of them are interesting to you, but not for me. So if I want to uh, do modeling using a data set I know from near, I want to, um, if somebody else have already done that, I will be very happy to learn from him or she or her to learn, uh, to save my time to do the data pre-processing process. So, and also for some very large uh, data set, like the online topic data set, uh, so they, they have like um, weekly topic consumption for thousands of topics. So it's very hard to redo the data importing and uh, uh, imp imputation and uh, pre-processing, or this pre-processing pro uh, process. So, um, so we want to approach to uh, share the knowledge um, among different people when we use the data set to do modeling. And finally, we want to combine the results from different models. That's because for some products, like for some high-end snakes, it's possible it can be impacted by two different factors. So it can be impacted by the average income level in the neighborhood. It can also be impacted by uh, the online interest in this neighborhood. So we want a solution to solve all these problems. We want a solution that can allow multiple people to work on this problem parallelly because this problem is very large. As you see, um, we have very, um, very different data sources and also people have different modeling approaches. So we'll, we want to divide this big problem to reasonable sub-tasks -task so people can work on them parallelly. And we want extensibility. So we want to maintain this project at a low cost of effort. And also we want to improve this project iteratively. And also we want this solution to allow some flexibility for the models. Um, so when, when there's a new data set to predict the sales, or when the models um, have a different modern approaches, then we, we need uh, this solution to be, a, um, to be consistent over time and uh, also allow the flexibility to adjust them. And also, we want some transparent um, from the modeling results. So uh, from this model, um, we want the consumer of this project to find the insights from the data set to see how these factors are correlated with the sales, uh, sales value of the products. And last, we want standardization. Um, so this will help the maintenance and the improvement of this project in the long run. Then we come to an approach which is called model stacking. So this was first proposed by Warford in 1992, so this is not a new approach. And later it was translated um, in statistical language by Bremen in 1993. And this approach is very popular in Kaggle competition, where people can try different uh, modeling approaches uh, for prediction, then combine the prediction to generate the strongest prediction. And here is a diagram of the stacking approach. And on the left, you can see we partition the data 
to different subset of data. So um, this is very unique. This is not a general stacking approach. In general stacking approach, actually um, they use the same data set uh, to fit the um, submodels. But for us, it's very natural to partition the data set beforehand because this data set, like where the data set, demographic uh, data set, and the online topic consumption data set, they have very different data importing process and the data pre-processing -proce -pre -pro process. So it's very natural to partition them beforehand so people, uh, people can work on different data set parallelly. And then we, we use different regressors to fit this subset of data set. So you can try linear regression, that's so uh, rich regression, uh, random forest, and so on. So it depends on your choice. Now, after you have predictions from those base regressors from level zero, you can stacker those predictions to at level one, where we have a stacking regressor here to combine all the predictions from the base regressor to generate a final prediction. So this is the diagram for stacking approach. And as you can see, it's very easy when you have a new data set. If you have a, uh, for example, if you think some unemployment data set can have some correlation with some products sales, then you can simply add a data set here and uh, fit this unemployment data set using a regressor then you uh, add the prediction from this regressor to the stacker re regressor. So it's very flexible to add a new data set. And also, it's very flexible to change uh, your modeling approach. You can try different regressors for different subset of data set. You can try, as I said, uh, linear regression or tree-based uh, regression um, here. So now let's look at the code, some code. So how can we build a base regressor at level zero? So first we need to construct a abstract class which is called base regressor here. And there are three important abstract methods in this base regressor class. They are get data, feed, and predict. And the get Data method is just some process to import the data. And the most interesting one is the fit method. So I will explain it in a more concrete, case, uh, concrete regressor example. So here is an example for a concrete, concrete based regressor. And uh, so for this one, I use the online content consumption data. So this is a data set where we have the number of uh, different type of page views that are consumed by the neighborhood weekly. So this data set is x here in this function. And y is the sales data for some product in stores. And then I can determine what pre-processing steps I want to use to apply uh, to the data set. We can normalize the data to do uh, imputation to a uh, few missing values in the data set. And we can do log room uh, transformation on the data set. And finally, we can use a lasso regressor to combine uh, to fit the transformed data set. And finally, we can make a pipeline using all the steps we have defined, we have determined in order. So these steps have imputation, normalizer, and the uh, log transformation, and the so. So all these components are from scikit-learn. So you don't need to uh, write very detailed code to implement this methodology. And using the pipeline is very easy to um, feed the data. So if you call pipeline.feed x, y, 
then it will go through all the steps you have determined beforehand. So you will first impute the um, X data set, then do normalization, then do log transformation, then lastly use the transformed X data set um, to fit the Y, the sales value here using Lasso regressor. So it's all um, predetermined pipeline. And last, you can save the pipeline into uh, a model in the class. So as you seen in the previous slides, I use pipeline to automate the fitting process for the base regressor. So it's very handy. And usually when we do modeling, there are three different steps. Yeah, data preparation, feature extraction, and the modeling. And for each step, you can look up um, in some like scikit-learn package to find the corresponding uh, modules. For example, if you do uh, imputation, then you can use the imputer from scikit-learn preprocessing package. And uh, also there's something similar corresponding factories, he, uh, modules here. And similarly, you can look up uh, the feature selection package to do feature selection. And if you want to do PCA, you can use uh, PCA, decomposition.kit PCA, to do dimensionality reduction. And also there are lots of choice in scikit-learn models. There are linear model, tree model, and uh, random forest, and so on. So you have a variety of choices. And uh, in previous example, we have determined how to process our, our, our data. Then you can just simply make a pipeline using all the, all the more modules you have chosen in the order you want to process the data. And after you feed your pipeline using your data set, you can easily retrieve the detailed information for the pipeline. You can see the detailed information for each step. And also you can see like what step you have included in the pipeline. And you can also look up the intermediate results after some steps in the pipeline. So this is very convenient. Okay, so we have talked about how to build base regressors. Then the next question is that how can we stacker those base regressors to form a stacker? And here, HZ is a base regressor, and HCN is a stacking regressor. So stacking regressor is a linear combination of base regressors. And the question here is actually how to find the optimal ways to combine the results from the base regressors. So one natural solution is to use least score fit to find the optimal ways, beta here, to, com uh, to combine the base regressors. However, you need to pay attention to two things. The first is that actually you cannot use the same data set to feed base regressors and the stacker regressors at the same time because of, of the overfitting issue. So in Brightman's paper, it suggests us to use leave one out estimate from the base regressor and use that leave one out estimate to do the fitting for stackers. However, it's very time consuming because to estimate uh, leave one out, um, it, you need to iterate over different rows in the data set, so it's very time consuming. So to trade off, uh, we actually use validation set approach. So we split the data to test, um, to training set and the test set, set, and we feed the base regressors using a training set, and we feed the stacker, st stacking regressors using the test set. And the other important thing is that you need some restriction on uh, the weight beta. So beta should be non-negative. The intuition is that um, you, if you want to put some base regressor into the stacker, uh, then if the weight is negative, that means this re base regressor is not performing well. So there's no reason to put 
than in the base regressor. Uh, sorry, to put in the stacking regressor, actually. So you can simply uh, get rid of that base regressor. So that's why the, we, we can have a restriction that the older ways should be non-negative. And also, metrically, it can fix the multi-collinearity issue. So um, because we have different, many different base regressors, all, and all of them have the same goal, they want to predict the sales data, the sales value for some product. So they are somehow correlated with each other. So by uh, enforcing this restriction, you can see um, the multi-collinearity issue is fixed by this. And after combining the base regressors using this approach, we can find the final result is better than the best base regressor. And also, uh, for some unknown uh, theoretical, uh, in practice, actually, it's better than rich regression for some unknown reason. It's not theoretical explained. At least I didn't find any paper on that. But in practice, it's better than rich regression. So rich regression is an approach, another approach to combine the base regressors and it can fix the multi-collinearity issue. But in terms of accuracy, uh, this approach is better than rich regress regression. And after um, combining the base regressors, then actually we can um, use likelihood ratio test to rank the importance for each Base uh, for the base regressors. And now let's look some code again. And the stacking regressor is a class, and this class takes two inputs, the list of base regressors, and the stacking regressors you choose to put in. So you take these two as a main argument to input. And remember that we have a constraint that all the weights should be non-negative. So when we determine, we, when we define the stacking regressor, we define a default stacking regressor, which is um, called combiner here. So it's a lasso regressor with very small alpha value. So that means actually we don't use the L1 regularization penalty at all. And we enforce all the co coefficients to be positive. So that, uh, that makes sure that all the weights are non-negative. So this is our default stake, uh, staking regressor. So, you have the flexibility to try other regressors like rich regressor or lasso, the other type of lasso regressor. But the default is the one suggested in the paper. And then let's look, look at how we can fit the stacking regressor. So first, we split the data set to training data set and test data set. And so here, the, the estimators are the base regressors. So we use the training data set to feed the base regressors parallelly. And using those fitted base regressors, we use the test data set to do predictions. So we have a stack of pre predictions from the base regressors using the test data set. And then we use the stack of predictions from base regressors and the true sales values from the test data set to fit the stacking regressor. So this is our major process for fitting um, the stacking regressors. And now let's look at how it applies to our, our cases. And here we, we show the results for two different types of products. One is some 
insect repellent product, and the other is some high-end snake product. And the both of them have about uh, 13 weeks of data for about 200 stores. And uh, here we use four different base regressors, a demographic model using principal component regression, well model using linear mixed effect regression, Pickle-Mans model using random forest regression, and the uh, online content cons consumption model using lasso regression. So um, you may ask why I choose these different regression models for different data set, especially for uh, the week of month model, why I choose random forest, it doesn't think makes sense. So um, the idea is to try different things for different data set and uh, to try something not that good to see if our stacker can pick the good ones from the bad ones. And here is the R square value for the different levels of regressors. So R square value is, a, a is the variance explained by the model. So the higher the R square value, then that means the better the model is. And uh, as you can see that the stacker, the stacking regressor always have highest R square value and is higher than, than the best base regressor, like the weather model here for the insect repellent campaign. And uh, also for this one, it's better than the best base regressor, which use the content consumption data here. And also, uh, this model is very transparent. So you can rank the base regressors using likelihood ratio test. So uh, because after we predict the uh, sales value, our customers are interested in which type of data is most important for the sales. So this one is try to answer this question. So for the inset repellent product, you can see the weather model is best. For the high-end snake product, you can see the content consumption model is best. And another good thing is that you can continue digging. You can, you may, uh, your customer may continue ask you what are the most important features in the weather model. So you can continue digging and find the most important features in the weather database, uh, in the weather subdata. So here you can see the temperature, humidity, wind are the top three important features for the weather model for the insect repellent data. And similarly, you can find the beauty and health topic is most important topic in the content, online content consumption data for the snake product. And also you can visualize the results by plot or scatter plot using the top important features from the data set. So here is a scatter plot of the top three important features from the weather data set versus the weekly sales data set. And this is for the insect repellent campaign. So as you can see, when it's hot and humid and there's no much wind, the in insect repellent have better sales. So that makes sense. And uh, so this is um, what I have done for the stacking approach. So let's go to the conclusion. And to conclude, I introduced a, um, how to build stack regression. And there are two key components. One is the base regressors, and the other is the stacking regressor. And first, we split the data set to training data set and the test data set. 
And we feed the base regressor using the training data set um, because we want to avoid the overfitting issue. And the advantage for the base regressor is that you can work on this parallelly. So many people can work on this project. And also it's very easy to add a new data set and try different model approach on that data set. And we standardize the implementation using scikit-learn pipeline package. So it's very handy. And the results from the base regressor is very transparent. So you can see what are the important features in the base regressor. To fit the stacking regressor, we use the test data set. And we use this score fit to find the optimal non-negative non ways to combine the base regressors. And the result from the stacking regressor is always better than the best base regressor. And also, we can find the important base regressors using likelihood ratio test. So actually, this is a test to measure the, imp the impact of adding a base regressor into a stacker. And then we show um, two case studies to demonstrate that th this works for different data set. And uh, I want to thank my colleagues, Josh, Patrick, Alex, Cal, because they contribute a lot for this project. And it's time for questions. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Uh, when you choose a model, for example, weather model, you choose the random forest. Uh, did you ever try the uh, other model for the weather later to get the same results? Uh, so the question is that where um, I have tried other models for data set for, yeah. besides random forest. Yeah. So uh, so this is a good question. So um, so yeah, we tried other models. Um, but because actually this data set is not a very good data set, so actually other models on, on the weaker month's um, data set is not performing well. But for other data set, like topic consumption data set, we tried, uh, besides Lasso, we tried random forest and uh, like a uh, rich regression. So we tried um, many different um, modeling approaches on that data set. So the advantage of this approach is that you can try as many modeling approaches as you know on one data set and pick the best one for that data set and save that and you can uh, use that for other products. <coughs> so does that answer your question? I mean, I would say, uh, did you, you tried that but you get different results, different ranking, that's what, uh, when you try the same data set Different model, do you get the same ranking like a? Uh, e or not? Um, e it depends on the quality of the modeling. Yeah, if you try a different, yeah, we, we tried different approaches. If that approach doesn't have very different results from, like, the random forest is not that like, different from Lasso, then actually the rank will, will not change. But if we try very bad, like, uh, modeling approach, like linear regression for very high dimensional data, then the ranking will change. Okay. okay. Thank you. Welcome. Do you have any plot or uh, the comparison how the stacking regressor perform well compared to single regressor? Uh, yes, so uh, I have one table showing that. So it's this square uh, for different level of regressor. So the, the bottom row is for the stacking regressor. But in that case, um, 
you didn't combine the for the single regressor you didn't combine all training sets you just uh, separate the training set and get the result and stack the model mm -hmm. actually uh, have all training sets different different um, oh. data and okay. has the the definitely she will have much better uh, yeah that, that, that's a good question so yeah, actually, this one is not just use the train, um, the test data. Actually, yeah, it use like a different uh, test data. So, um, so for example, demographics, weathers. We if we combine, then okay. we probably uh, get better. Oh uh, yeah, yes. So yeah, actually, I yeah. So sorry. So actually, yeah, for this model, I I didn't use the sum models there. Um, the VT sum model here. Actually, I use the whole data set to train these sum models and uh, compute the R squares. So it's not using the uh, training data set to feed the model. I use the uh, combination of training and the test data to feed the sum models and do the comparison. So, um, so actually, yeah, it's confusing here because the sub models yeah. here are, so are not really the sub component. They they are using different data set to fit because, uh, as you said, it's unfair to compare them if they are using different data set uh, to fit because the stacking model have more data set for training. So for here, actually, I for for the sub models, I use the whole data set to fit it again to compute the R scores. Uh. Uh, I think this is this might be right. You know, you have two ways. One is just use all the data and choose the best model, or you can use some other ways to combine combining several models together to, to get a, a better one. Usually, this kind of combining ensemble method will give you a better results in the literature. So there, there are several ways to combine uh, models into a single better one. So uh, this stacking is one method. And there, there are some other ways, like uh, uh, boosting or bagging. Uh, did you try other ways uh, to combine several models into one? Uh, so obviously, there is no single winner among these three. Each each method there's, has its own advantage, I believe. So for example, the Stacking method will give you a better, um, you know, accuracy, and maybe I think bagging give you a, a, a variable uh, deduction and better variable. Uh, so, did you, did you try other uh, ensembling method? Uh, uh, um, uh, yes, and uh, for some uh, cases like boosting and bagging have better results, but here we also want to the result to be <laughs> transparent. So this stacking approach is more linear, so it's easier to interpret the results in this approach. So it's a trade-off between accuracy and the interpretability. So uh, accuracy is not uh, the whole. Yeah, oh, sorry. The, uh, yes, you are correct. The kind of transparent and easy, easily kind of track the that your training set and the, the prediction result. But as Bo mentioned, probably mm -hmm. bagging or boosting uh, may have better performance compared to stacked model because it's quite linear. Uh, you mean boosting and uh, bagging? Um. So, so, I, so, so, uh, so I think there, 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 there may be no, no one single uh, winner here. So as I said, different models have uh, uh, different uh, advantage. Stacking is a very good method. So compare with with boosting and the bagging. The, the, you know, there, there's like you said, there's trade off here. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was curious if you were to so for insect repellent, weather is obviously guiding a lot of uh, your prediction here. Um, would it make sense to have two base regressors for weather, one with, you know, like a random forest and one with the other thing? Or would that start overfitting and uh, scrub your results? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, uh, you can do that, but uh, it brings the difficulty in interpret the data if like both of them like contribute a bit in the stacking. Then it's hard to like compute the importance from the two two base regressors together. So yeah, it, it can improve the accuracy, but in terms of interpretability, it's hard to interpret using two different models at the same time. And with that, we have to cut it. Um, let's thank Lanwei. And uh, any further questions, we'll take it to hall. <laughs>